Pints with Jack, Season 4, Episode 80. After Hours with Dr. David Downing. Welcome, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast where Matt, Andrew, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we've eavesdropped on the correspondence of Screwtape and listened to his toast at the Tempters Training College. But we're now in the middle of Narnia Month. And in previous weeks, we've read and discussed the chronicle of this season, which has been The Silver Chair. And today, we're talking to a Narnia expert, a name which should be familiar to every Lewis fan, co-director of the Wade Center and author of many Inklings-related books, Dr. David Downing. Dr. Downing has provided a critical introduction and over 400 explanatory notes to a new edition of Lewis's book, The Pilgrim's Regress. He's also written four books related to Lewis, Planets in Peril, a critical study of the Ransom Trilogy, The Most Reluctant Convert, an examination of Lewis's journey to faith, Into the Region of Awe, a study of how Lewis's wide reading and Christian mysticism enhanced his own faith and enriched his imaginative writing, Looking for the King, a historical novel in which two young Americans meet Lewis and Tolkien in Oxford in 1940, and lastly, the book which we'll be discussing today, Into the Wardrobe, an in-depth overview of the Chronicles of Narnia. Dr. Downing, welcome to Pints with Jack. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to join you. I'm honored to join you. This is going to be fun. I think it is. And, and I must say, this has been a long time coming to have you on the show, because I finished reading the final pages of your Lewis biography, The Most Reluctant Convert, while I was sitting with my mother in the woods by Lewis's home, just prior to taking a tour of the kilns. Uh, and also, Matt and I met you briefly, you and your wife, Crystal, at the symposium in Montreat a few years ago. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that was that was an excellent gathering. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> it was so much fun. I think Matt was kind of overwhelmed. <laughs> Did you come to that evening session with Doug Gresham? We sat around on the porch and uh, smoked yep. pipes. And, yeah, that was that was a wonderful session. That was so much fun. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. that bottle of VAT sixty nine that I brought with me was destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> As I mentioned in my introduction, as well as having written many Lewis books, you co-direct the Wade Center with your wife, Crystal. And my wife and I have just bought a house in La Crosse, Wisconsin, which is about four hours away by car. So I have informed my wife that I'm anticipating that the Wade Center will pretty much function as our summer home in the coming <laughs> years. But for those who don't live nearby and are unfamiliar, what's, what actually is the Wade Center and what do you do there? Okay. Well, the Marion E. Wade Center is a collection of seven British Christian authors. Uh, it was founded by a visionary professor in 1965, Clyde S. Kilby. And he realized that Lewis was going to be an influential figure just a few years after Lewis's death. So it started out as the C.S. Lewis collection. He began getting uh, editions of all his books, first editions, unpublished letters. For a while, it was housed in the uh, library here at Wheaton College. But in 2001, a woman came forward and said, I think you need your own building. Uh, her name was Mary Wade. She was the daughter of Marion E. Wade, who was the founder of Service Master, a very successful uh, Christian company uh, here in the United States. So we got in, that was 2001. It opened three days before 9-11. But this gives us a lot more room to collect all seven authors. Uh, they're, all of them either were friends of Lewis or important influences. So many of them are Inklings, Tol Lewis, Tolkien, Williams, and Barfield, also his friend Dorothy Sayers, and then two important influences, G.K. Chesterton and George MacDonald. So we collect all seven of those authors, and we discuss all the interactions among them, and it's a fascinating place to work. We have a museum. We have Lewis's wardrobe that was in his home growing up. He and his brother used to get inside and tell each other stories. And of course, so it was always in his mind, a wardrobe is a portal to imagination. Uh, his cousin remembered that. So we have the wardrobe. Children come in all day and open it up. We actually have fur coats in there. We have mm -hmm. Warney's old uh, military army jacket. And they constantly knock on the back door. They want to see if it leads anywhere. We're thinking about putting in a hinge and they fall out into the gift shop, you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, we have a museum space. We get about 10,000 visitors a year before COVID. Uh, we also have a reading room, which has all of the editions of our, our authors, all the uh, uh, primary works by the authors, but also all the secondary works and all the journal articles and all the dissertations. So you could literally write a dissertation or a book on one of our authors 
without ever going online. We physically have all the resources right there. Uh, we also have uh, fragile storage downstairs where we have a lot of first editions, a lot of unpublished letters. Uh, so it's, as I say, a very stimulating place to work and to do research. So yes, you definitely should come visit. We'll take you out to lunch. And uh, if we enjoy the conversation, we'll turn on a, a tape recorder and, and uh, have you do a podcast for us. Go the other direction. <laughs> Yeah, that would be fantastic. Uh, and so it was the Wade Center listeners when we had Alan C. Duncan, when he came on the show to talk about his book about Lewis and Chesterton, this is where he went for everything. Right, right. We have a number of people. Uh, I think that we have over 100 books that in the acknowledgments, this is thank you to the wonderful people at the Wade Center, by which they mainly mean Laura Schmidt, our archivist. She is a genius when it comes to tracking down resources on our authors. Uh, but yes, I'm sure there's at least 100 books that acknowledge the way we give out a uh, an award every year called the Kilby Award, the Clyde Kilby Award for an important publication that's based on Wade Center research. So we're happy to uh, contribute to the lively scholarship on our seven authors. Now, you mentioned your podcast there a little bit earlier. Uh, would you mind explaining what you do with that? Well, Chris and I just came to the Wade three years ago, the summer of 2018, and all these interesting people would come through the doors. Uh, Olga Lukmanova is doing a, a translation of all of George MacDonald's important works into Russian. Uh, she was raised a communist, learned how to assemble and disassemble an AK-47 as a junior hire. And then she became a Christian. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, who doesn't know how to do that? Uh, became a Christian in her teens after the fall of the USSR and... Uh, so now she really wants to make our authors known to uh, her Russian readers. So she's fascinating. Uh, Patty Callahan came in to do research for a novel called Becoming Mrs. Lewis, which became a bestseller. And now she has a new one coming out in the fall called uh, Once Upon a Wardrobe, about two children who are reading Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. And the, the older sister meets C.S. Lewis and gets to ask her all kinds of questions about where she got this idea so that's, I think that's going to be a, a best-selling book this fall. So we meet so many interesting people. I kept saying, I wish I could have recorded that conversation. That was so interesting. <laughs> uh, and finally, uh, our uh, Aaron Hill, our producer, said, well, I know quite a bit about podcasting. Well, let's go ahead and start recording these. So we started having conversations with Doug Gresham and Michael Ward and Malcolm Geitz and Patty Callahan and on and on and on. Sometimes we don't have a guest, so... Uh, the three of us will just talk about a Lewis book or McDonald or the effect of World War I. Um, it really took off during COVID. We now have uh, 70,000 listens in 100 countries. I'm interested in how often there are little enclaves in Pakistan and Turkey and Nigeria where they really want to connect with the larger Christian church. And so they'll uh, contact me on Facebook and say, here I am in Kazakhstan or uh, India, we have over 500 listens or 500 listeners in India. So that's also been fun to connect with people that ordinarily would never have a chance to physically come to the Wade Center. Hmm. I do like the fact that the origin of your podcast is somewhat similar to our own insofar as there are lots of people that I wanted to talk to because I read and enjoyed their books, but it's really creepy to say, hey, I want to talk to you for an hour and record it. I might share it with some friends, <laughs> That's true. but That's true. you can take that same idea and just couch it under the terms of, would you like to come on my podcast? And suddenly it's socially acceptable. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. If you met them at a cocktail party and then back them into the wall and said, I want to talk for an hour, that would, that would be creepy, but a podcast, is, it's a good way to go, isn't it? Now, you mentioned COVID has disrupted the Wade Center. How has it affected you guys and uh, what, what's the plans for the future? Well, ordinarily, uh, we get about 10,000 visitors to the museum space and about 1,000 researchers coming to the reading room a year. Last March, like everyone else, we had to close down. Uh, we expanded our work in many ways. We did more uh, Zoom cast for book launches. Uh, our podcast audience doubled. Uh, we weren't able to travel. Uh, the year before the COVID, Chris and I spoke at 20 venues in eight different states. So part of our job is to represent the way all around the country and even to England and Canada, if we can get there. Uh, but obviously that was all shut down. So everything was through uh, the internet rather than through physical travel, either people coming to the Wade or our traveling around the country. 
Well, I want to start talking about your book. And in order to do that, we've got to get through the standard episode segments. So let's jump on to the quote of the week. And this comes from the dedication to Lucy Barfield in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where Lewis wrote to his goddaughter, one day you'll be old enough to start reading fairy tales again. Mm. And since it's Monday morning and reasonably early here on the Pacific coast, I'm having a cup of Earl Grey tea for my drink of the week. Dr. Downing, are you drinking anything? Uh, I have crineapple juice on the rocks. The rocks have uh, melted, so now it's just diluted crineapple juice. <laughs> well, cheers. <laughs> cheers. So let's go back to the beginning. When did you first come across Lewis? Uh, I didn't read Lewis until college. I was raised in a very conservative uh, Christian home, and I didn't read the Narnia Chronicles. I didn't read anything by Lewis. I later asked my mother why she didn't introduce us to Lewis. And she said, well, he was an Anglican and he drank and smoked. So how, how spiritual could he be? Uh, <laughs> so now I would say quite spiritual. So when I got to college, I had a lot of struggles, a lot of questions about uh, the incarnation, the infallibility of scripture, the problem of evil, kind of the usual suspects when it comes to things that challenge your faith. I'd gotten a lot of uh, unsatisfying answers growing up. I remember a Sunday school teacher, I was studying in grade school, the the Navajos, and they were so peaceable, and they made blankets and jewelry, and they tried not to get into uh, internecine wars with other tribes. And I said to my Sunday school teacher, what about the Navajos? They had no, there's no way that European missionaries could go give them the gospel. Are they all going to hell? And my teacher said, well, God knew who wouldn't respond to the gospel in those days. And he put them all in North and South America. So Oof. the missionaries wouldn't bother. And that wasn't, that wasn't intellectually satisfying, even for a kid. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> when a kid tells you that your answer is stupid, yeah, yeah, sure, it's probably bad. stupid. <laughs> no kidding. Um, my dad had a better answer. He said, you know, you just need to trust the nature of God and, and let him work out the details of the logistics of salvation. That was a better answer than my Sunday school teacher. But when I got to college, uh, I was asking these questions. And it wasn't until I ran across C.S. Lewis and Theodore Dostoevsky. I read in literature classes. First thing I read was Paralandra in a fantasy course. And it just blew me away that someone could use fantasy as a vehicle to convey spiritual insights and theology. I would read H.G. Wells and Jules Verne, and I enjoyed the adventure stories. But I'm reading along and I say, they're talking about the psychology of temptation. And what if Adam and Eve had another chance on a different planet? And, uh, you know, what if the, uh, the serpent was quite a bit more subtle on Paralandra than he was in the book of Genesis? So <laughs> once I read Paralandra, I loved the vaulting imagination and the spiritual depth. And so I finished the Ransom Trilogy, and then I did Mere Christianity and Screwtape Letters. Uh, I read the Narnia Chronicles in two weeks in uh, my sophomore year, and then I was so sorry when they ended, I picked them up and reread them all in another two weeks. So within a month, I'd read them twice. Uh, and uh, I wrote the, the paper for that. I wrote for this class on Paralandra, my professor liked so much. We sent it off to Christianity Today. So my per first publication was as a college kid. That was several decades ago. And somehow I didn't realize that that was going to be the mark of my career, that first article as a sophomore in college. When I got to graduate school, I had a Christian professor named George uh, Tennyson who worked with Barfield. He wrote a book on Owen Barfield. And I said, you know, the Ransom Trilogy, that's not just beach reading. That's not just airport reading. That's significant literature. There's a lot of illusions. There's a lot of theological depth. And he said, well, why don't you? What? And I said, I'm surprised nobody's written a book on that. And he said, uh, well, why don't you write a book? And I get, I, I'm just a graduate student. I don't know anything. I'm waiting for some seasoned scholar to do this. So I waited several years and he kept uh, bringing up this topic. So finally, I wrote Planets in Peril as my first uh, book link study of Lewis's works. And once again, once you succeed in one area, uh, early in your career, you go to the publisher saying, could you please look at my manuscript and what do you think? And is this publishable? But after you have a certain amount of success, the publishers start coming to you. So I didn't make a conscious decision to become a Lewis scholar, but things worked out that way because people kept saying, how about something on Narnia? How about something on... A, some people are dissatisfied with surprised by joy because there's so many digressions on 
boarding school and his father's eccentricities. And several times at conferences, people said, I wish somebody would just write a straight ahead biography of Lewis's spiritual journey to faith. And once mm-hmm. again, I said, well, that's something I could do. I could write a, a biography of his. So that came about. Often my ideas for books come from conferences. You hear people saying what they think is missing in their uh, reading of C.S. Lewis, and you decide to fill that gap. It's interesting that you began with the uh, Ransom trilogy, because I think that is an area that really apart from your book, it has been by and large neglected until this past year when suddenly we now have two new books That's right. coming out. That's right. Which I'm really pleased about because a lot of Lewis's books will trip people up. And the first time I read the Ransom trilogy, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and uh, just just getting that little bit of help as you start to peel it back and, and, and l- learn how to read it and see that y- your intuition is telling you that other things are going on here. Your intuition's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's correct. Uh, well, as I say, uh, I did this annotated version of Pilgrim's Regress because people said the same thing. They said, I got 20 mm-hmm. pages into it. I don't know Greek. I don't know Latin. Uh, I don't know all these these characters that he's referring to. So I said, you know, if we gave them annotations, that would help a lot. Because it is a good storyline, but he was writing for a very small elite audience that we're trying to. Someone wrote him later in life and said, I tried to read Pilgrim's Regress and I just couldn't make it through. And he wrote back and said, oh, don't bother. I wrote that before I realized how to write for, for general audiences. <laughs> uh, so as I say, many of my books come from trying to help readers get more depth out of their reading of Lewis. I find nowadays that even what I consider to be the easy books, people want a guide to screw tape letters. Hmm. And they say, well, it's all backwards. When they use the word enemy, that's God. So he's Satan's enemy, but he's not our enemy. And I go, well, that's the charm of the of the book is that everything's upside down. But uh, more and more, I, I see there's an annotated screw tape letters by uh, Devin Brown, who you had on the on the show recently. Uh, it was Paul McCusker. Oh, yeah. Paul McCusker. Well, Devin helped him. Some of the, some of the notes. It, yeah. Yeah. What I consider some of the easier books are being annotated and people are getting steady aids and helps. Yeah. And I'm really pleased about that. I listeners to this podcast will know I'm always saying that we need more annotated editions of Lewis's stuff just to help you with the speed bumps so that when you get this obscure phrase in French, Latin, German, it'll it'll just help you and tell you what it is. Because Lewis wrote for his audience, but sometimes his audience was much smarter than I am. So I need a little bit of help. Yeah. Right now we're working on an annotated, illustrated, uh, surprised by joy for Harper One. Marjorie Lamp Mead, the associate director, and I are going through, once again, a lot of French phrases, a lot of allusions that you wouldn't catch. So we're having a lot of fun. When he talks about going to this boarding school, we're going to put in a picture. And when he talks about meeting this person. So it's going to be it's going to be helpful, both the annotations and the illustrations. I think a lot more people will get more out of Surprise by Joy than they do in their current reading. Uh, that makes me really happy to hear. Yes. I was actually pitching for Surprise by Joy to be the next book that we do, but I was outvoted. We're doing The Four Loves, but I'm going to make another pitch for Surprise by Joy after that. So uh-huh. this, this this timing might work out well. <laughs> Our next uh, podcast from The Wade Sitter coming out is on autobiography. So we're doing Lewis's Surprise by Joy, uh, Chesterton's autobiography, and then uh, Dorothy Sayers wrote an unpublished one called Catamary, an, an autobiographical novel. So it's always fun when uh, the, our authors start thinking about the meaning of their own lives, the, the shape of their lives, as Lewis put it. And even virtually all of those had multiple goes at it. I mean, you can they look did, at right. Lewis's work and you can say surprised by joy. You can say early prose joy. You could say till we have faces. Right. There's even sections of The Great Divorce. You see his autobiography appearing multiple times. And I'd even say the same for Chesterton because you've got also – orthodoxy and uh, man alive right <laughs> which they bear a striking resemblance to a certain rotund the- uh, writer <laughs> and journalist that i've heard of yeah, that's right that's right and some people think gaudy knight has a lot of autobiographical elements she goes back to visit oxford and uh, they they believe that, that the idea of the famous novelist going back to to visit oxford is, has a lot of autobiographical elements crystal could talk about that uh, more intelligently than i can she said an accomplished Sayer scholar. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about your book, Into the Wardrobe. How did that come about? 
Well, when they decided to make a movie in 2005, they started making, uh, Walden Media started making the Narnia Chronicles. They didn't get through the whole sequence. We're going to have to wait for, uh, is it Netflix or Amazon? Who's going to do that? It's Netflix. Yeah. Amazon are ruining Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Netflix are ruining Narnia. That's right. That's probably how it'll work out. I just saw a New Yorker cartoon where the Hollywood executive is talking to his staff and he says, let's take a classic movie and remake it, only everything will be worse. And you go, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what they sometimes do with the, our, our, our author's books. Uh, well, anyway, the movies were coming out. I got a call out of the blue from Josie Bass, who published the book, and said, we would like a Narnia guide from you. And I said, well, there's already four or five out. At that point, there were four or five. Now there's 30, probably. And I said, I know all the, I know Walter Hooper. I, I know the uh, Peter Scackle, others who've written Narnia guides. So I'm not sure if it's necessary. And she said, well, we'd like one with your name on it. You have a good reputation in Lewis studies. And I said, well, thank you, but I'm not sure. And then she, she gave me a number. She said, would you be willing to do it for this amount of money? And I said, I think I would be willing to do it for that amount of money. <laughs> so I learned that I have a price. It's kind of a sad thing to learn about oneself. Uh, just as long as that price is reasonably high. When you work out that you have a price and you're cheap, then it's Yeah, that's true. That's true. But now I wonder if somebody says, uh, hey, would you be willing to assassinate somebody? I'd go, well, no, of course not. Well, how about for this amount of money? And then I'd have to go, well, is it a good person or a bad person? You know, I'd have to. I did discover after they made the offer, I discovered when I read the earlier Narnia guides, they hadn't done, I didn't think they'd done enough with medieval and classical elements. They hadn't mm -hmm. shown how many of the names have a clever uh, double entendre to the name or a source for the name. And also some of the literary sources, I discovered that Horse and His Boy is heavily draws upon uh, the uh, Arabian Nights and Voyage of the Dawn Treader draws heavily upon St. Brendan's Voyage. So mm -hmm. Lewis would take these classic stories that he loved and he would kind of Narniaize them. Uh, Tolkien said, somebody asked Tolkien if he was the character of Ransom in the Ransom Trilogy. And he said, no, I don't think I'm the character, but I see a lot of my ideas Lewisified in the Ransom <laughs> Trilogy. So there's got to be some adjective for Lewis taking many of his favorite myths and legends and, and bits of folklore and Lewisifying them or Narniaizing them, if that could be a verb. Aslanification? Uh, yeah, Aslanification. There you go. <laughs> I really noticed how much... Lewis put into the Narnia Chronicles in the sense of you could take his career, his Christian faith, his love of dressed animals he talks about in Surprised by Joy, his love of classical and medieval worldview, and then a lot of his autobiographical experiences, a lot of his personal life experiences. Uh, I'll give you an example of one I just noticed recently. Now, have you done the Silver Chair yet as a podcast? We did that this season. Well, there's a scene where they're trying to, they've gone through most of their adventures, they've killed the witch, they're trying to escape Underland and get back to Earth, and they're digging upward, and suddenly it's pitch black, and suddenly Jill disappears, and they'll go, what happened to Jill? Where did she? It turns out she broke through on a hill, and she came out in, in the snow, but for them, it's just like this magical disappearance. Last time I was reading Surprised by Joy, he talks about when he was in boarding school, these bullies came and grabbed a bunch of the new students and they threw them in a coal bin and it was pitch black. And suddenly one of them just disappeared out of nowhere. And it turned out he'd fallen down the coal chute to the lower level. But to their minds, he just vaporized. And I read that incident and I said, I have a feeling this, this strange mm -hmm. moment in the silver chair where Jill just disappears. I have a feeling that may be tied to his memory of uh, one of his fellow uh, froshers are disappearing in the coal chute and he knows how terrifying that is yeah, when you, yeah. You, you're in pitch blackness and then somebody disappears <laughs> that's right that's yeah. the beginning of most horror movies yeah that's true <laughs> that's exactly right yeah now your book is peppered with some really lovely illustrations throughout who produced them uh that's an artist for josie bass named richard shepherd he illustrates quite a few of their books so if you get a chance to look at their catalog you'll see other of his work yeah, they really are charming. I love them. I have a nursery to decorate soon, so I'm, 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 I've got my eye on our Narnia imagery. Oh, there we go. Good. <laughs> so your book begins with a history of Lewis's life. What aspects of it do you think are particularly important when it comes to understanding Narnia? Well, uh, the death of his mother is a, a major event in his life. He says that uh, after 
my mother died, the great continent had sunk like Atlantis. It was all sea and islands now. And especially a magician's nephew, he had a lot of trouble writing magician's nephew. He meant it to be the sequel to Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, but he kept picking it up and putting it down. And I think part of it, it was uh, he, it was very emotionally draining for him to create a character whose mother was dying of cancer. And he wanted to go to Narnia to find a way to save her. Uh, so you see that in Narnia. A lot of the little incidents I just mentioned, like Jill uh, disappearing, seems to come from his life. Also, his anti-school attitudes all through Narnia. Uh, they want to get away from school and they can hardly wait for the holidays. And he, he said as an adult, he was surprised when he would mention something to a little child. They would say they're going to school and he'd say, oh, sorry about that. And they would say, oh, I enjoy school. And he was always surprised. He always thought that school was like a penitentiary for children. So a lot Lewis of that. and I were on the same wavelength <laughs> on that one. Well, a lot of that attitude developed from his own personal life. Uh, in many ways, Narnia represents... Uh, Lewis's world before his mother died. There's there's a world of faith, a benevolent creator. Uh, there's medieval and classical elements. There's dressed animals. There's knights in armor. So in some ways, uh, one of his uh, biographers said that uh, A. N. Wilson said he's really writing for the child in himself, and I think that's true. And that's part of the reason I you ask uh, about the appendix. We'll get to that later. But he had amazing vocabulary growing up. He was reading Milton and Shakespeare. In his early teens, he has some Shakespearean allusions in a letter he wrote when he was 11. Uh, he picked up Dante later in his teens in the original Italian. So when he's writing Narnia, he kind of forgets that most of us uh, don't have his background or his precociousness. Uh, so anyway, I do think he's writing for the child and himself. And I think even the uh, there's a kind of emotional healing in The Magician's Nephew of writing about a little child who was able to save his mother. Can you imagine uh, what kind of a triumph that would be in real life if you could, you know, not only keep your mother alive, but say that you were responsible for doing that? Yeah. Well, your your next chapter describes the genesis of the Narnia series. And as I said, up until now, we've only read up to the silver chair on Pints with Jack, since we just do one one of the chronicles each season. Uh, but given that, what are some key points in Narnia's formation up until that point? Well, he said in uh, an article that when he was in his teens, just about the same time he read George MacDonald's Fantasties, which was a tremendous influence on him to have this fantasy story with all these spiritual undertones. And he said about the age of 17, he had an image of a fawn uh, with an umbrella holding a parcel on a snowy day. And he carried that image with him virtually his whole life till he started writing the Narnia Chronicles in the late 40s. Now, I think it's not accidental, that image, because fawns show his love of fairy tales and myth. The umbrella, he loved England and English weather. He said, I like all <laughs> kinds of weather. It doesn't have to be sunny. So the umbrella is okay with him. And when, when he was at boarding school and even during the war, he's constantly writing, can you send me this book or writing to a publisher? I think for him, parcels meant a new book in the mail, intellectual mm -hmm. stimulation, a wonderful new story. So he never he never parsed that image, but I think it combines his love of Englishness and his love of the classics and his love of, of anything that came in the mail in a parcel. So he had that image that he carried with him from teenage times. During the war in 1939, both the Tolkings and the Lewises took in children from London. Since London was liable to be bombed, Oxford was considered a safe area. And just watching the children, he said they're delightful creatures, but they have trouble entertaining themselves. So he wrote one paragraph in uh, 1939, 1940, about four children. They had different names. Peter was the youngest, and then there was Anne and Martin and Rose. And he only wrote that one paragraph about children uh, leaving London because of the war and going out to the countryside. It shows you never throw away a draft mm -hmm. because it took almost a decade for him to get back to that story. Uh, finally, in the late 40s, he writes and says he liked to write some children's stories in the spirit of uh, Edith Nesbitt, who he enjoyed as a child. And in Edith Nesbitt, you don't have an individual child, Alice in Wonderland, Dorothy in Oz. It tends to be several children having an adventure together, uh, although they're not very individuated. One thing I love about the Narnia Chronicles is the children have real personalities. They're not just mm -hmm. kind of two generic boys and two generic girls. So I think 
uh, the initial spark, you could say uh, he wrote them all in about four years, in the late 40s, early 50s. But you could also say he'd been writing them his whole life, going back to his teenage years, to having children in his home, to finally deciding he wanted to do something in the spirit of Edith Nesbitt. Once he wrote them, they came amazingly quickly. Most of them took about three months to write. The only one that took a lot of time was The Magician's Nephew. Instead of being second, it ended up being second to last after the, before the... Uh, by the way, I do recommend that you read them in the order they were published. I think it's more exciting yes. to... You, you can stay on the podcast, please. Continue. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, he actually uh, wrote uh, a student named Lawrence Creek. A little boy wrote him and said, wouldn't it be more logical to read them in Narnian chronological order, starting with creation of Narnia? And he said, yes, I suppose that makes sense. And then Walter Hooper decided, well, maybe Lewis wanted them published in a different order. But uh, Walter Hooper, the last time I spoke to him before he passed on, he said he wished he'd just left them alone. He wished he'd started with <laughs> Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, because when it, So he had repented before the end. That, repent. That's good to know. And we just when we had uh, Michael Ward's uh, book launch, we had a raffle, gave out some free copies. And uh, one of the uh, young ladies who won a free copy was the daughter of Lawrence Krieg, who is the little boy who made that suggestion. Wow. So I didn't tell her, but I want, I either wanted to say, I want that book back or <laughs> I want to talk to your father. <laughs> a lot of people have been confused. You don't get the uh, numinous element line, which the wardrobe, Mr. Beaver says, Aslan is on the move. Mm -hmm. And they all had this inner stirring of the spirit and this wonderful sense of, of mystery and, and numinous feelings. And if you've already read uh, Magician's Nephew, you know who Aslan is and you know he's a lion and you know that he's sort of the god figure of the stories. So, and also when you read Magician's Nephew first, he says, I'm now going to explain all these comings and goings between Earth and Narnia. And if you read it first, you go, what? What comings and goings? There haven't been any comings and goings. Yes, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a uh, strident advocate of reading them in the order they were published. Quite right, too. Yes, I actually was texting one of my friends in Colorado today. He just bought one of the single volume books of the Narnia Chronicles. Uh -huh. It's beautiful. But I said, you are going to start with The Lion, the Witch, the Wardrobe <laughs> first with my godson, right? That's right. He has, That's right. He has assured me that he will. Oh, good, good. Okay. <laughs> Well, you also talk about the spiritual vision of the Narnian Chronicles, and particularly relating to the different aspects of Aslan. Uh, what are you trying to help the reader understand when you talk about that? Well, part of the reason that you write a book about a subject is to show there's a lot more depth to it than people recognize. Uh, sometimes people get so enamored of Aslan as a Christ figure in Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, that pretty much they think it's an allegory, which Lewis said it's not an allegory. Mm -hmm. It's a supposal. Suppose there was another world that needed redeeming and suppose uh, God went to that world in a different form of, of a lion rather than a human being. Uh, but people often, they stop with Aslan, the Christ figure, Aslan, the redeemer, Aslan who dies and comes back. Uh, I was talking at a student from a non-Christian college and she said, why do people think Lion, Witch, the Wardrobe is uh, a, a, a Christian story? I enjoyed it, but I don't see what's Christian about it. And I said, well, Aslan... Uh, takes the penalty for someone else's sin or error. Uh, he dies and they're heartbroken. Then he comes back to life and they're jubilant. Doesn't that remind you of anything? And she said, oh, <laughs> it's, it's like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and I said, we need more biblical literacy around here. <laughs> so I, but I did want to stress that uh, George Sayer, one of Lewis's biographers, his personal friend of biographer, he said the most well-rounded view of Lewis's view of God that you will get, his theology, is not mere Christianity, it's not miracles, it's in the Narnia Chronicles. You really see how he related to God and how he thought about God. So I want to emphasize not only uh, the Christ figure in Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, but obviously the judge in the last battle, which you haven't gotten to, uh, the creator. Uh, in many ways, some of the books he acts, you really see him more as the Holy Spirit. In Voyage of the Dawn Treader, He's not involved in the action. He doesn't lead the troops. And he doesn't, but when he appears, it's mainly as a guide and a comforter. Uh, and so, in some ways, he's more the Holy Spirit representative in that. There's a famous scene in The Horse and His Boy, which is your favorite, The Horse and His Boy? Absolutely. That's my favorite. Uh, that's interesting because most people have problems with the uh, portrayal of Middle Easterners, and so they're uncomfortable with it. 
people are wrong and need to be better well read. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I think he's getting most of those images out of the Arabian Nights. He's yeah. not claiming to be an expert on uh, the Middle East. Sorry, small soapbox. Yeah, I wasn't going to talk about Holson's boy, but you've mentioned it now. It really irritates me when people say, oh, he's clearly, he's clearly speaking about Islam. It's like, the Kalamins are not monotheists for right, a start. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, I think there, there's a lot of ways and that's misunderstood. People these days, they really go looking for these kinds of things. I had to do an actual count. Someone said, how come he has so many female villains? We have the White Witch and we have the Queen of Underland. So I did a count. There's twice as many male villains in the Narnia Chronicles as there are female villains. It, it, it's true. I was listening to another podcast where somebody was talking uh, about the the White Witch, and they made a whole load of assertions about the text, about the number of times Lewis did this and that. And just in my head, I thought, that just doesn't seem right. And I went back and looked at the text. It's like, no, he mentions that once. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh, well, as I said, the reason I wrote this chapter is I wanted to give a more well-rounded view of how much theology there is in the Narnia Chronicles. You could really do worse to introduce someone to Christianity by having them, you could do worse than have them read the Narnia Chronicles and say, what is God like? Because you see a lot of facets of Aslan. I love the scenes where he doesn't just tell people uh, that they've done wrong. He waits for them to figure it out on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, in the silver chair, when, uh, who's up there? I can't remember. What's the little girl's name in the silver Jill. chair? Jill. Yeah. Jill Paul. And he says, now, why did he fall? Well, he got too close to the edge. And finally, she says, well, I was showing off. And he just says, well, that's a good answer. Good answer. And there's a lot of wonderful scenes where he expects you to do a certain amount of moral self-examination. He's not just going to tell you what you did wrong. I taught, I taught an adult Sunday school class here in uh, Glen Ellen, Illinois, called Narnia for Adults. And I really focused on the psychology of the characters. And adults can completely identify with what these children are going through, uh, the pride and the selfishness and the lack of empathy. So the moral psychology uh, is, really holds up well for adult readers. I remember reading it in college and thinking, this is some of the most insightful portraits of human character that I've seen in a children's story. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you talk about using Narnia as a, a precursor to hearing the gospel. A little later this month, I'm actually interviewing Dr. Brian Williams, because he's got a oh. book called C.S. Lewis, Pre-Evangelism for a Post-Christian World. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that book. Is that out yet, or is that... It is out, yes. Yeah, I have a copy. I've heard that title, so I need to get a hold of that book. <laughs> Part of the problem of being the Wade director is trying to keep uh, up to speed on seven authors. There's all these wonderful new books coming out, <laughs> biographies and analyses and interpretation. And so that could be a full-time job, just trying to keep up with our authors. It's the same doing the podcast, trying to get the uh, authors of new books onto the show right? Uh, and trying to keep it somewhat uh, cohesive with what we're talking about that season. That's just too much stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah. Now, as one digs more into Narnia, the more one sees the classical and medieval world. And this was the thing I particularly liked about your book, because you really draw that out, because if if you don't if you don't come to Narnia having read the right books, as Lewis would have said, a lot of this stuff seems really strange. Right. So why does Lewis inject so much of the classical medieval world into Narnia? Was it simply because this is what he taught for his day job? Well, he loved the medieval and classical worldview. That's part of the reason he started out thinking he was going to be a philosophy professor, and he eventually uh, moved over to literature. And especially became medieval and classical literature. Uh, I think part of he loved it imaginatively. He realized it wasn't true. He thought there was a lot of continuity between the classical world. Uh, when he uses the word pagan, he doesn't mean that derogatorily. He means the classical writers who evolved into Christian writers. And he says in uh, Discarded Image, if you wonder what happened to the classical writers, well, they became Christians, many of them. Uh, I think he loved that idea of hierarchy. He loved the idea that. Uh, God is above everything, and then you have nine orders of angels. Uh, the, each angel is the mover of a planet. So he knew it wasn't true. He says at the end of Discarded Image, as you can tell, I'm greatly enamored of the medieval worldview. It has one problem. It's not true. But then he goes on to make some very uh, uh, profound statements along the lines of Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions, that often we create models and nature simply answers the questions that we ask it. And he reminds people that we often live by models right now as much as the medievals did. 
So he loved the sense of hierarchy. Even when you're reading the Narnia Chronicles, Peter is the eldest. And so he's the one who's going to become the high king. And he's the one who has to be a leader. Several times, nobody wants to approach Aslan. But Peter somehow knows that as the eldest, it's his duty. And so he steps forward. Uh, there's a scene in Voids the Dawn Treader where Caspian wants to go with Reepicheep to on this mystical voyage to Aslan's country. And it's okay for Reepicheep to do that. Uh, Lewis described in the letter as a, as a person on a mystical quest. He's trying to find uh, the, uh, the land's end or the utter east that was predicted by his nurse. Uh, that's another thing about Lewis's life is nurses are always good in Lewis. He loved his nurse as a child. And he associated with that period of, of emotional tranquility. So whenever you meet a nurse in the Narnia Chronicles or other stories, they're going to be positive characters. <laughs> uh, but mentioning uh, hierarchy, it's okay for Reaper Chief to take that journey. And Caspian says, oh, I want to go too. And they all tell him that's a mistake. And Aslan finally appears and says, well, as the king, you don't get to choose what to do. You have to lead uh, Narnia. And he talks about that in uh, in uh, Preface to Paradise Lost, that every station has certain virtues and certain vices. And so for a leader, uh, remissness, not doing your job, is one sort of sin. And tyranny is another sort of sin, uh, trying to use your power to abuse others. But then as followers, you have certain sins. One is disobedience, not doing what you're told to do. And one is insurrection or rebellion, you know, refusing to accept someone as your leader. So this medieval worldview, he makes it very explicit in Preface to Paradise Lost. When you're reading Narnia, you go, oh, that's why it's not okay for Caspian to go with Reepicheep. And that's why Peter is the one who has to step forward. So there's all these embedded medieval values of chivalry and hierarchy in the story that I think really add to its charm. Now, you wrote other chapters, one on morality, one on the names of Narnia, which is really interesting. But I want to now jump to the last chapter, the seventh chapter, and very appropriately, given the subject matter. And the seventh chapter is entitled Lewis's Literary Artistry. And some people might find the use of that phrase, you know, a phrase like that for a children's book, right. inappropriate. Um, why are they wrong? <laughs> well, I think part of it is the mind of Lewis. He just didn't do shoddy work. He, he, there's not a single one of his books that he just tossed off. But, you know, some people actually write a book because they're offered so much money. But Lewis never, you know, I don't know who these people are. But uh, <laughs> the uh, craftsmanship, the, the depth of characterization, even though I love Alice in Wonderland and even though I, I love Wizard of Oz and I'm going to get myself into trouble here, even The Hobbit they don't have a lot of depths of psychology. They have a lot of adventures and mm -hmm. you have some basic good and evil, but you don't get something of the depth of Edmund's descent in Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. Where he's already a brat, but then he lies about being in Narnia and then he allies himself with the witch. And he, and then, but when, right when he's at his moral a low point, you start seeing a little bit of empathy. He, he, mm -hmm. When he sees the stone lion, uh, he feels sad. There's something sad and tragic about this stone lion. Who's, and then he feels empathy for the picnickers who are all turned to stone. And then he enjoys the coming of spring. And there's a kind of emotional and spiritual depth in that characterization of a child. It's unusual for children's literature. So it has a psychological depth. It also has a theological depth, as I said earlier. This is really a well-rounded view of a Christian's view of God, the judge, the comforter, the redeemer the creator, uh, a lot of different roles that are explored in the Narnia Chronicles. And then it has unusual literary depth in terms of the illusions. Uh, Imeth is the good Calamine soldier in the last battle. Well, his name in Hebrew means faithful. So why shouldn't Imeth be faithful? Uh, the uh, Puddle Glum, one of people's favorite characters in the silver chair, that's actually an obscure allusion to a, a a Renaissance poet named John Studley, and he described the river Styx as a puddle of glum. And Lewis thought that was really a funny understatement. So sure enough, puddle of glum becomes the name of a character. So I really think his literary artistry shows up in the deceptive simplicity of the stories, but how you can do an archaeological dig and find literary references, even in the names of characters. You can find a lot of good Christian theology 
And you find a lot of perceptive psychology uh, all buried behind the, these well-plotted children's stories. <laughs> now, I, I didn't want to wrap this up before we talk about the appendix of your book, because I think it's really helpful. It's a really good resource to have when reading the Chronicles. So what do you provide there and why do we need it? Well, Lewis was writing for British readers in the 50s. And he also, as I say, he was writing for himself as a child. So whenever I teach Lewis, people always say, what does show the white feather mean? And I go, though, well, that means you're a coward. Uh, now, what is Turkish delight exactly? I tell them, <laughs> don't sell out your brothers and sisters for Turkish delight. Basically, well, at least do it for a oh, Snickers. Yeah, exactly. It's a big glob of jelly that's covered with confectioner's sugar, but it's not worth selling out your family for. <laughs> so I get a lot of questions from my students. And then as I'm reading, some things you just need to know, what does that word mean? What is a portcullis? That's the big grate that comes down at the door of a castle. Uh, what is hastelude? Well, that's sword play. These are words that he picked up from reading all of his uh, Mallory and Milton and Spencer and uh, all these adventure stories, Sir Walter Scott. So a lot of it is just knowing what the word means. Often I try to show there's a lot more depth than people realize in a scene. You haven't gotten to this yet, but when Diggory comes back and gives the apple of youth to Aslan, and he's so uh, heartbroken that he can't take it directly back to heal his mother, and Aslan says, oh, my son, my son, only you and I know grief. But when he says, my son, my son, I have a strong feeling that's the uh, lament of David over losing his son, Absalom. He says, oh, Absalom, mm -hmm. my son, my son. So I'm trying to point out, once again, that literary artistry. There are all kinds of allusions to Shakespeare when they have the Parliament of Owls in the silver chair. Well, of course, Chaucer wrote a book called The Parliament of Fowls. So it's just another way to uh, get people to see the depth of the stories. When I wrote my publisher and said I was going to add an appendix, she said, oh, no, no, this is a children's story. We don't want an appendix. That's too scholarly. And then I sent her the uh, the terms that I cover, and she goes, yeah, we want it. We want it. I would have, you know, have just called her a poltroon and then just waited <laughs> exactly, for the response. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, what is the chatelaine, uh, Jadis calls herself the chatelaine of the castle, and nobody knows exactly what a chatelaine is. So a lot of those words, if you didn't, I mean, if somebody showed you the words without reading Narnia, hmm. they would probably say, no, that sounds too hard for me. I don't, I think I'll go read some James Joyce. Narnia sounds too challenging. Yeah, so I, I really enjoyed uh, answering people's basic questions about vocabulary, but also showing a lot of hidden depth in the, in the storyline. Yeah, and the thing that I'm repeatedly struck by whenever I reread Narnia is how many books written in this generation, period, even before we get to children's books, are we still reading today? Right, that's a good point. Yeah. And even with a little bit of a learning curve, you know, as you point out, there are words and phrases that kids are not going to know. And probably the parents reading them to the kids probably aren't going to know them either. But yet they still continue to capture our imagination. Well, something on my wish list, I won't say bucket list because I'm getting old enough. I don't want people to take that literally. So I'll just <laughs> say wish list. Uh, I would like to do for HarperCollins an annotated Narnia where all of these notes are right there on the page. Mm -hmm. So when you see Portcullis, there's a quick definition. When you see... Uh, Colney Hatch or Colney Atch they talk about. That's an insane asylum in London. So mm -hmm. I think that'd be great if people could just be reading along and just take a quick glance at what that word means. So yeah, that's on my wish list is to do an annotated Narnia. I like it. More annotated editions, the better. Recently, the Chesterton Society put out a simplified version of orthodoxy that sort of extracts the um, more complicated references. And I, I just don't think that's the right way. I think Leave the text as is, but just provide the readers with a little bit of help. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that, especially Narnia. That would uh, be some kind of a crime to try to abridge Narnia. <laughs> Dr. Downing, thank you so much for coming on Pints with Jack. Where can listeners go to pick up a copy of Into the Wardrobe? And where can they go to find out more about you and the Wade Center? Well, I have an author profile on Amazon, so you can always start on Amazon. Uh, the Wade Center has its own website, uh, Wheaton.edu slash Wade, W-A-D-E. And that has a lot of information on our authors, a lot of information on our holdings. We give a list of all the books that Lewis owned and annotated. It's fascinating to come to the Wade and read the books he read and see that what he marked in them. I just found one recently. The person was making fun of mysticism and saying it's all delusional. And Lewis took Mrs. Christian mysticism seriously. 
So in the in the margin, it just says, "This man is a fool." So <laughs> he couldn't he didn't mince any words when he was reading his books. Uh, so yeah, I would say come to uh, Wheaton.edu/wade. Uh, for me as an author, I have a profile on Amazon. Uh, I also have a blog on cslewis.com. I have about 12 or 15 essays about a variety of topics relating to Lewis. Or come to the Wade Center, or you could actually order a signed copy from me uh, from the Wade Center. Sometimes people say, could you put to Lydia, the most spiritually uh, profound person I've met? I go, I don't know Lydia. For all I know, she could be a uh, you know, a criminal. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, if you would like to get a signed copy, feel free to write us at the Wade Center, and we'd be happy to send one out to you for the for a reasonable fee. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Danning again for coming on the show, as well as all of our Patreon supporters, particularly our top tier supporters who help us put on the show. That's Shane, John, Kevin, Brian, K, Monique, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Jake, Stephen, Matt, Jeff, Kelly. Chris, oh, I nearly made it through in one breath. John, James, Kate, and Rowdy. <laughs> Thank you all for your support. And uh, please follow us on social media. It's We're on all the good ones. Facebook, Twitter, MySpace. And you can also find us on Patreon. And we've got some uh, events coming up that we're starting to plan. We haven't announced them yet, but they're going to be good ones. They might actually be starting next season. Uh, it all depends on how needy my newborn child is as to when this actually happens. Uh, But please join us next time as we're going to continue with Narnia Month and we're going to continue going further up. And further in. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Excellent conversation. (laughs) 